Okay, I think I'll begin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joanne Knowlton Gabriel, and on behalf of Darien Library, we welcome you to our program tonight, Mozart in Vienna with Gil Harrell. Gil returns this evening to continue with part two of our four part series on Mozart entitled Monstrous Many Notes. He will discuss what happens to Mozart after having a disastrous visit to Paris. Will Vienna be any better? Stay tuned to find out. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this evening is a professor of musicology and music theory at Naugatuck Valley Community College. His many honors include a distinguished teaching award from Baruch College, where he served on the faculty and the exemplary service award from NVCC. While not busy giving lectures, he can also be found conducting his college's chorale, capella ensemble, and is the musical director of theater productions. In his spare time, he performs as a pianist and vocalist. Please welcome Dr. Gil Harrell. Thank you so much for that introduction, Joanne, and thank you to the members of our community who have gathered here on Zoom to uh, continue this journey we started in September. And in September, we picked up where Mozart was right around 25 years old. He had returned from Paris in a disastrous state. Uh, the journey, as we described, was one dotted with tragedies for him. First, he fell in love essentially with the wrong girl the wrong girl for a couple of reasons, primarily because she wasn't interested in him, at least not in that way. Tonight, we're gonna to learn that Mozart, approximately five years after meeting this woman, whose name, well, she was really a young woman, uh, Aloysia Weber, this woman that he fell in love with on his way to Paris, who rejected him, who spurned his love so coldly, so callously, as a later generation would say, she ghosted on him, essentially. She just stopped talking to him, including one infamous moment where they, um, reacquainted on his way back from, from Paris when he was on his way back to Salzburg, and she ignored him. She pretended as if he wasn't even in the room. Well, Aloysia Weber might have broken Mozart's heart, but by some strange twist of fate, he would wind up marrying, of all people, her very sister, Constanza. And to make matters even more unbelievable, at the time that he was courting Constanza and eventually we would marry her, of course, he's writing an opera where the main character's name, and I'm not making this up, is Constanza. So this is a really uh, wonderful and strange series of events that leads Mozart eventually to the marriage altar and to what, by all accounts, uh, was uh, many years of wedded bliss. It seems to have been the case that Mozart was really deeply in love with his wife, and uh, even though there have been some musicologists and biographers who have speculated that he may have strayed from the marriage bed um, into the arms of another woman, there is no evidence to, uh, to support that, including the latest biographies, the latest musicological scholarship shows really nothing that went beyond flirting. So that's one uh, loose end we're gonna tie up tonight, Mozart's romantic life. We also said in our last lecture that one of the reasons Mozart's trip to Vienna, excuse me, to uh, Paris was so disastrous was because he failed to secure any lasting, meaningful, sort of high level appointment at one of the esteemed courts of Europe. So that would include Paris or perhaps Versailles, Mannheim, Augsburg. He's unable to secure employment in the terms of, uh, of that day it would have mean, meant uh, procuring a position like Kapellmeister, which translates to something like chapel master but essentially meant the head of music at a particular establishment, a particular court. One would think that after his youth, which Mozart had spent most of his youth, as we remember from our last lecture, traveling all over Europe, going as far as England, crossing the Channel, where he almost died, by the way, of smallpox at the age of seven. He would carry the scars of smallpox on his face for the rest of his life, even though in the portraits of Mozart, the painters obviously omitted those scars. So you don't see it when you look at paintings of him. But nonetheless, he survived smallpox. He traveled all over France, Germany, Austria, and eventually all over Italy. And in doing so, between the ages of six and 17, Mozart established himself as the archetypal Wunderkind. Remember, Wunderkind is a German term, one of those wonderful German compound words, Wunder meaning wonder and Kind meaning child. 
Mozart established himself as the archetypal wunderkind in Europe. And so much so that when he would visit, that is to say, when his father took him to various courts all around Europe, uh, they would collect gifts, often very impressive gifts, golden snuff boxes, fancy clothing, sometimes monetary honoraria, things like that. Uh, Leopold Mozart stockpiled quite a bit of cash during these tours. And more importantly, Wolfgang Mozart, Wolfie as he was known in his youth, and was called uh, by his wife in his uh, adulthood, uh, Wolfgang had established himself as the premier virtuoso child prodigy of Europe. One would think that if this 20-something year old is now looking for employment, any court in Europe would have been desirous of procuring his employment. He would have been an ornament to any court. And yet he was rejected, um, rejected by Empress Maria Theresa, who is the uh, the, the ruling uh, sort of regent of the Holy Roman Empire in its twilight days. The uh, Holy Roman Empire would essentially collapse in 1815 by the time of the Congress of Vienna. So Mozart lived to see not exactly the collapse of the empire, that would be, that would be something that took place during Beethoven's lifetime. But Mozart is alive during what we could call the sunset of the Holy Roman Empire, which started in the year 800 when Charlemagne was crowned on Christmas Day and and uh, continued really up until 1815. This is the end of that period. And Empress Maria Theresa um, rather callously rebuffed Mozart's offer. It was actually her son who wanted to bring in Mozart to be his court Kapellmeister. And the, his mother, that is to say, the mother of the prince, the Empress Maria Theresa said, I don't think you want him. We don't, uh, we don't hobnob with these trained monkeys, essentially is a paraphrase of what she said. So, he is unable to secure employment on this trip to Paris. Today, we'll want to answer that question and tie up that loose end, namely to answer, well, what sort of employment does Mozart uh, attain or achieve or procure when he arrives in Vienna in 1781? And what leads him to go to the imperial capital, to Vienna? We'll talk a little bit about Vienna today, and I'll tell you some interesting things about the city in the 1780s. The last thing that um, we'll talk about today is Mozart's relationship with his family. And as you'll remember from our last lecture, the pinnacle of tragedy, or perhaps we could say the nadir of tragedy that occurred uh, during his trip, his ill-fated journey to Paris in the late 1770s was the death of his mother. And if you remember what we said at the end of our September lecture, after his mother died, his father wrote a very, I think, cruel letter. Most uh, people would probably agree that it was cruel because in it, he writes, if it you know, if I had been there, your mother would still be alive. In other words, he places the blame uh, for the death of Anna Maria Mozart squarely on the shoulders of his 23-year-old son at the time. Um, that obviously is a very, very uh, callous thing to do. And uh, Leopold Mozart, as um, his son got older and as his children got older in general, became increasingly callous especially towards his son. He seems to have held a certain uh, favoritism towards his daughter, Nanerl Maria Anna Mozart, uh, Mozart's elder sister, who was his senior by approximately five years. And this is going to drive wedges in the family, specifically between Mozart, who's located in Vienna, and Leopold, who's back in their hometown of Salzburg, the western part of Austria, and um, Nanerl, who's going to marry a, a, a widower, uh, who already had a number of children, of, of an impressive brood of five children. She's going to marry this widow or bear her own children and remain fairly close to Sal Salzburg for the rest of her life. And she lived to be uh, impressively old by the standard of the 18th century. She would live to be uh, past 80, which is quite remarkable, considering especially that her brother died a month shy of his 36th birthday. But um, if anybody in the family, uh, I think, was maybe Mozart's favorite, it was probably his mother. And um, we know this because they seem to evince the same sort of sense of humor. We talked about Mozart's scatological sense of humor, his preference for body jokes, for ribald jokes, uh, and certainly for um, sophomoric jokes, ones that involve bodily functions and human orifices and things like that. Mozart's letters, um, well over 200 of which survive, are dotted with references to the latter. And in fact, I think it's something like 18% of his letters contain 
mention of bodily function. So that's, uh, I think, a, a significant indicator of what kind of sense of humor Mozart had. So let's resume the journey. He returns from Paris and let's imagine his state of mind. His pockets are empty. He's not only uh, had to blow through whatever money he had, he's had to sell his mother's wedding ring in order to pay the doctor's uh, bills uh, for the doctors who, I would put this in scare quotes, who took care of her during her last days. Remember what we said in our last lecture about medicine in the late 18th century. If someone survived an illness back then, it was probably um, despite the best efforts of the doctors and not because of the best efforts of the doctors. Um, medicine back then still believed in, a, in an archaic um, system that was based around the idea of humors and the balance of humors in the body. And so bleeding was thought to be a very therapeutic uh, treatment. And of course, all that did was further deplete the vitality of the victim. Often uh, these victims were dehydrated and, and uh, struggling to uh, get adequate nutrition in general. So bleeding someone was only going to hasten their demise in most cases. That would certainly be the case for Mozart when his turn came in December of 1791. So he's, his pockets are empty. He feels, uh, we might imagine, the, uh, the weight of this guilt that his father has uh, put on his shoulders. His father has all but uh, asserted directly that his mother's death was his own fault due to his own negligence, perhaps. He's failed to attain any uh, employment, which had to have weighed on his confidence and his psyche and made him feel like perhaps he'd lost a step, that he wasn't as impressive as a 23-year-old as he had been as a seven-year-old playing violin with a blindfold in front of the Pope or whatever it was. Um, and of course, now he's got to come home to the last place he wants to be, which is in Salzburg, and to see his father and to meet his father's gaze, this in the wake of his mother's death. He spent some time in Salzburg, and uh, despite these many, many uh, sort of psychological maladies that must have been plaguing him at the time, uh, he's able to remain prolifically active as a composer. And one of the pieces he writes during this period is a concerto for two pianos. And since many of us here this evening have probably never heard or seen a concerto for two pianos, uh, I thought it might be a fun way to begin the program. We'll have time today for probably four uh, pieces, I think we'll have a chance to look at four pieces from different genres. First, a concerto for two pianos. Then we'll look at Mozart's Mass in C minor, one of his greatest liturgical works up there with the Requiem. We'll then turn to Mozart's Fantasy uh, and Fugue in the key of C, uh, which is, uh, if you listen to it, you might think that it was written by someone who had lived in a previous generation because it approximates the style of Johann Sebastian Bach. So absolutely convincingly, Mozart's mastery of counterpoint and fugue uh, at this point was really second to none. And then we'll end the program today by talking about Mozart's relationship with uh, Josef Haydn. Josef Haydn, the, one of the other towering uh, composers of the classical period of the Enlightenment period, uh, was 24 years older than Mozart and yet they became very close friends and biographers have speculated all throughout the ages about the exact nature of the relationship between these two great composers. And uh, most agree that there seems to have been something of a father-son dynamic between the two. Uh, and this would become complicated when Mozart's actual father, Leopold, visited Vienna in the mid-1780s and uh, would, would actually meet Josef Haydn, the so, sort of surrogate father. Um, all right, let's talk about the concerto for two pianos. Mozart's sister was a virtuoso uh, in her youth and remained active as a pianist. But as we said in our last program, she never really pursued music vocationally. There were a number of reasons for that, but the main reason is the one that probably most people would guess, which is to say she was a woman. And as a woman, opportunities as a professional composer would be very limited. You could uh, perhaps have a career as a professional performer. For example, as a pianist, Mozart had students who were professional pianists. Uh, Barbara Auernhammer, uh, one of his students in Vienna, would go on to have a very uh, uh, successful career as a concert pianist. And obviously you could be a prima donna, that is to say, 
a leading lady in the opera. But uh, in the case of Nanurl, in the case of Mozart's sister, uh, neither of those things would ever come to fruition because Leopold married her off to a, a, um, essentially uh, a widower, um, a minor aristocratic lordling who um, already had a brood of children. And so she found herself in her late twenties married to a widower who was significantly older than her. That wasn't unusual in those days. And now she had five children to take care of. And then she would get pregnant and have more children to take care of. There's a wrinkle to that story, which we'll revisit later in the program, but nonetheless. Mozart wrote this concerto because when he came back to Salzburg, Nanerl ostensibly could have performed it with him. So this is the concerto for two pianos. Um, the performance we're gonna watch is, is kind of wonderful in a way because uh, it's the concerto here is being performed by twin sisters. Uh, these are the sisters uh, Ani and Nia uh, Sukarnishvili, I think is their name. Uh, for those who have an interest in etymology, then you'll probably recognize that name. Anything that ends in Shvili or Ili is typical, um, uh, typically a, a Georgian name. And when I say Georgian, I don't mean uh, Savannah or Atlanta. I mean Georgia as in Tbilisi, um, the former Soviet satellite. And so uh, when we watch this, we have the mirror image of the way the pianos are arranged on stage. And uh, we have these twin sisters playing it. So it actually gets this, it amplifies that mirror image uh, effect. Let's see, we have a question here. Okay, great. See that, that question, I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll get to that. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this concerto that Mozart wrote to showcase his sister's skill. And here are the sisters, Ani and Nia uh, Sunatishvili, I think is how the name is pronounced, twin sisters of uh, Georgian uh, descent. And here they're playing, you can see how the pianos are conventionally arrayed so that the crook of one piano fits into the longer end of the other. And again, the mirror image uh, effect here is especially amplified when you've got twin sisters performing. So let's go ahead and listen to some of the first movement. We won't have time to listen to the whole thing but we'll listen to the first section, which is called the exposition. The nice thing about music in the enlightenment period is that it is compartmentalized into very neatly divided sections. We have names for these sections. We call them exposition, development, recapitulation, coda. Uh, we have themes within those sections and uh, lovers of this style of music are perhaps familiar with this structure, the architecture of music in the period. One of the reasons they, created music in this way was to aid the listener in being able to, uh, to follow along with these sort of, as I mentioned, these compartmentalized sections so that one wasn't overwhelmed by an incessant stream of notes. Um, this is sort of the classical perception of Bach. They felt that Baroque music was sort of incoherent in a way because it wasn't, um, it, it didn't have punctuation marks is essentially how you could think of it. Um, here in the classical style, in the late enlightenment style, we have a lot of, um, of punctuation marks, whether they're commas or periods or occasionally exclamation points, ellipses, uh, all of these things have analogs in the music and we can go ahead and appreciate it. Here is, let's go ahead and share sound. Here is uh, Mozart's concerto for two pianos and orchestra. Notice we have a cadence, right? That would be the, uh, the analog again would be for uh, some kind of punctuation mark, perhaps a period or semicolon or something like that. Notice that the soloists haven't played yet. That's very typical in the concerto style. This is what we call the double exposition form. Essentially what it means is in any concerto, you're gonna start by having the orchestra introduce the primary themes. And then what you have after that is some kind of a cadence an arrival, a moment of repose, after which the soloists begin to play. So here is the entrance of the two soloists. You can hear once again, a very emphatic cadence as the music comes to a moment of repose. Again, in, in music, those moments are called cadences. Um, it's, it's, you, we can imagine the siblings here, uh, twin sisters, but in uh, the 1770s, in the very end of the 1770s, would have been Mozart and his sister. And there's something very sweet about that, but also something very bittersweet about it. Of course, because we know the end of the story, those siblings would eventually become estranged by the end of their, end of their 
uh, the 1780s, really by the end of Mozart's lives, life, they had to exchange a letter in over two and a half years. In fact, when she first heard that he was sick and dying, um, she remarked about how you know she had heard almost nothing about him for, for years up until that point. So to imagine them here, this is sort of the end of their time together. And we'll talk about why that is momentarily. Let's go ahead and see. We have a, yeah, the, uh, the siblings here are uh, two Georgian sisters. Uh, their names are Ani and Nia Sukanishvili, I think is how it's pronounced. And uh, it is a sort of, as with most concerti, are more interesting to watch than to simply listen to an audio recording because obviously with a concerto, it's such a personalized uh, performance. Um, but in this case, having twin sisters performing makes it especially interesting. All right, that was the Mozart concerto for two pianos written really at the very end of his time in Salzburg. And it must be said that Mozart, after he leaves Salzburg, he will come back one more time in the 1780s, and we'll talk about that. But this is it for him. He is done with the town of Salzburg. And around the time of his 25th birthday, he's going to travel uh, not to Vienna quite yet. He's going to go to Munich. And he's been invited to travel to Munich, which remember is in Bavaria, of course, and so it's not too far from Salzburg. Mm -hmm. He is going to travel to the, uh, the court of the elector, Karl Theodor, who was a great lover of music, by the way. And Karl Theodor uh, has commissioned Mozart to write an opera for the carnival season, which always took place in, in January. And Mozart's going to write a very successful and very well-received opera called I Domineo, King of Crete, or Re de Creta. It's an Italian opera seria. It's going to be Mozart's, really his last opera, where he's writing for a castrato soloist. The role of Idamante uh, is one of the last castrato roles that Mozart will, will write. Actually, uh, this is sort of the end of the castrato period in opera in general. As many of you know, if you like opera, if you go down just another 10 years from now to the end of the 1780s, uh, Mozart's later operas don't involve any castrati. There's no castrati in The Marriage of Figaro or in Don Giovanni or in uh, Così fan tutte or Die Zauberflöte, The Magic Flute. Um, they, this is it for the castrato on the operatic stage. So we're witnessing tonight uh, many uh, sort of twilights. This is the end of Mozart's relationship with his sister, essentially. Uh, it's the beginning of the end of his relationship with his father. Um, it is uh, the end of his mother's life. It's the end of um, so many of the elements of, of uh, late Enlightenment music are also going to start to change in the 1780s. And Mozart will be a herald of this new style, which we'll see emerging. So how does he make his way over to Vienna? Well, once again, despite the success of his opera in, um, in Munich, that is to say the success of Idomineo, uh, no position is offered to him. In fact, the quote from uh, Carl Theodor, nor Theodor, the, uh, the elector of the Munich court is essentially, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, alas, my boy, but there are no vacancies. And this is something Mozart had heard so many times and imagine it was a real burr in his saddle to hear those lines spoken to him. Alas, there are, there are no positions open. We have no vacancies. In other words, thanks, but we don't have any room for you here. We love you, but not that much. So Mozart goes back to Salzburg. And remember, when he's at Salzburg, he's technically in the employment of Archbishop Hieronymus Colorado. Colorado was one of these bureaucratic church officials who had this lofty title of Prince Archbishop. And he essentially ran the town of Salzburg. He wasn't hostile towards the Mozart family, but he wasn't exactly supportive either. Mozart was a servant in his retinue. He was one of many servants in his retinue. The archbishop traveled with a host of servants. And these would be all sorts of servants. You had a tailor to make sure your garb was, was fitted and they, everything was uh, sewed up and mended and uh, tailored to look exactly the way you wanted it to look. You had a cobbler to fix your shoes if you needed. You had a blacksmith uh, to travel with you just in case your horses needed fresh shoeing. Whatever it was, you had a retinue that you took with you. Uh, cooks, obviously, and all sorts of grooms and stable hands and you name it. The, the um, figures of that period who were wealthy and powerful traveled with a big entourage and musicians were part of that entourage, no more and no less. Well, we know that from our last lecture, but what we don't know perhaps is that when Mozart is summoned by the archbishop to travel with him to Vienna, 
It's because um, there's going to be a new emperor crown. In fact, Maria Theresa, who I mentioned at the beginning of the program, has died. And it's time for a coronation. And so all of the great um, aristocratic princes of Austria are going to come for the coronation to pay homage to the new emperor, to bend the knee, so to speak, and uh, pledge their fealty to the new boss, essentially. And so these princes are traveling with their entourages, and Mozart is summoned to travel in the company of the Prince Archbishop. And he does so. But he's frustrated at this point for a number of reasons. First of all, he hates Salzburg. He hates the Prince Archbishop. He hates a strong word, but let's say he has a deep antipathy. Maybe that's a nicer way of saying the same thing. Um, and he feels like he's being grossly underpaid, which incidentally, by any metric, he was grossly underpaid. He was being paid something like 450 florins a year, which was a pitiful salary for someone of his talent. But he's going to get pushed over the edge when they arrive in Vienna. And the reason he's pushed over the edge is because he's given an opportunity by one of the many aristocrats in town for the coronation to play a weekend series of, of concerts. And he's offered a tremendous sum of money. It's something like very close to his yearly salary to do a weekend's worth of gigs. And Mozart says, of course, but naturally he has to get permission from his employer to do so. And of course the Prince Archbishop, Hieronymus Colorado, who knows what his motivation was, but the guy turns Mozart down. And this is too much for Mozart to, to bear. He won't countenance this kind of insult. And so he contrives a way to get himself fired. And when I say he contrives a way to get himself fired, I mean, in those days, remember musicians are servants. They, you can't really quit. You can't put in your two week notice uh, the way you could today if you didn't like your job. And so he decides to put in, uh, instead of putting in his two week notice, he decides to essentially get on the archbishop's nerves to um, anger him to the point where Mozart will be dismissed from his service. And he achieves that. This moment is actually, uh, sort of alluded to in the movie Amadeus, if you remember when Mo Mozart uh, humiliates the archbishop in front of that crowd uh, in, gathered in the one of the palatial uh, estates where the archbishop was lodging. Actually, the story of his dismissal is more violent than that. Mozart was uh, dismissed literally with a kick to the posterior. Um, that is to say, he was thrown out of the presence of the archbishop by the archbishop's uh, steward, a guy named Count Arco, and Arco literally put a boot in Mozart's uh, rear end and shoved him out of the room, uh, something that Mozart chronicled in a letter home to his father, where um, he basically says, you'll never believe what, what this guy did to me to add insult to injury. They, they basically, you know, kicked me in the, you know what. Um, in a fascinating twist, Mozart would, um, Mozart's father, I should say, would side with the archbishop. And that would really drive one more uh, nail into this, uh, this coffin that was essentially uh, sealing off the um, whatever amity and whatever love, uh, I shouldn't say love because that likely always existed, but whatever amity, whatever um, sense of warmth existed between Mozart and his father. If it was frayed at this point, uh, by 1781, it is all but gone when Mozart's father takes the side of the archbishop. He essentially writes back and he says, get back there and apologize to him. You know, how could you insult him like that? You know, you've, you've got to beg for your job back. Mozart's father seems to have been worried about his own position at the Salzburg court. And that's why he encouraged his son to, uh, to go basically groveling for his job back. And Mozart was so bewildered by this and wounded that uh, he, he, one gets the sense reading his letters that he almost doesn't know what to write. And this is really the beginning of the end of his, uh, that warmth, that flame that had burned so brightly between father and son, one of the greatest father-son duos in the history of Western civilization. And the sun is setting on that relationship in 1781, mostly due to Leopold's intransigence and truculence when it came to uh, Mozart's employment with the archbishop. So now he's in Vienna, what's he gonna do? Well, he's gonna establish himself as what uh, a freelance uh, musician today would be very well acquainted with, which is essentially a lifestyle where you take gigs wherever you can get them. You compose music and hope to get an honorarium when you compose it. Maybe you dedicate it to someone. And another thing you do to supplement your income, which is really the only stability in the life of a freelancer is you teach. You take on students. Mozart, by the way, uh, 
hated the uh, the idea of teaching. He thought himself above it to some degree. He had very little patience for students who were not gifted. And uh, in general, it seems that, you know, as a, honing his pedagogical talents was just not something he was interested in. He could be a very effective pedagogue, but really only when he was interested in the students, when he thought they had potential. And um, there is a funny story about uh, Mozart having a student uh, whose name was Barbara von Anerhammer. And uh, Barbara was very talented, Barbara in English, she was very, very talented. But apparently she was, at least in Mozart's uh, view, uh, quite homely. That is to say, not a pulchritudinous young lady, but rather, as Mozart said, uh, hideous, ugly. And uh, yet he seems to have had tremendous affection for her. And in fact, he wrote some uh, piano sonatas and even a concerto that's dedicated to her. So she must have been a fabulous pianist to be able to play his music and Mozart must have held her in especially high esteem. Well, freelancing would have its bumps and would have its high points and its low points. And teaching, as we said, was not Mozart's favorite thing to do, but he did it to pay the bills. But eventually his life would change uh, dramatically when he would meet in 1782, the woman who would go on to be his wife. And her name, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, was Constanza Weber. Now remember, Mozart had fallen in love with Constanza's younger sister, Aloysia, in the late 1770s during his travels through Augsburg and Mannheim. And she had spurned his love brutally in really harsh fashion. And so now the uh, Weber family, which uh, was Father uh, Friedelin had died at this point. So they left the town of Mannheim and they now moved to Vienna. And they had a boarding house. They, they rented out rooms essentially. And that's how Mozart met Constanza. He moved into this house. He rented a room there where one of the Weber daughters, there were four of them, um, he and Constanza became close. And there are many, many wrinkles to this story. Constanza's mother becomes involved and she seems to have been quite a conniving woman, um, Frau Weber was, but nonetheless, eventually they will get married. And as I mentioned at the top of the program, it seems to have been a very happy marriage. Unlike so many composers in history, who either didn't marry or did marry and were miserable. And there are many in the 20th century, you could think about Leonard Bernstein and in the 19th century, there's no dearth of composers whose uh, love lives were spotted with tragedy and, and uh, really despairing moments. Uh, Gustav Mahler is another one, as we know his uh, wife, Alma Schindler Mahler um, would, uh, would have a very well-publicized scandalous affair with a, a, an architect from the Bauhaus movement who had the name, and I'm not making this up, his name for those who know his name is Walter Gropius. Um, so Mahler uh, had his heart broken by his, uh, his wife Alma. Um, in the 19th century, Wagner had been married to, uh, to someone when he uh, leaves Germany in the 1840s and he tries to hit on someone else's wife and tries to sleep with Matilda Basendonk and then his wife dies and then he he eventually shacks up with Cosima uh, List, essentially, who had married someone else. She had married Hans von Bülow, and then Wagner has an affair with her and gets her pregnant while she's married to someone else. It's a whole strange, sordid, uh, and a very lubricious story, which we'll skip the details, but obviously a lot of instability in his love life. Beethoven was a bachelor, he never married. Handel was a bachelor, he never married. Schubert was a bachelor, he never married. Uh, most evidence suggests overwhelmingly, the evidence suggests that Schubert was a gay man living in Vienna in the early 19th century, which, which had many challenges that it brought with it, obviously. Um, Robert and Clara Schumann were happily married for a time until he had uh, some kind of psychotic break and went into a sanitarium for the last couple of years of his life, and she never visited him by his own request. Um, this again, on and on and on. Uh, Josef Haydn, who we mentioned earlier in the program, was married and uh, he just came to despise his wife brutally. And uh, you might say, well, why didn't he get a divorce? And the answer was because he was Catholic, born in 1732. And, and they certainly, uh, uh, even in the most extreme circumstances, did not uh, pursue divorce. So amidst this, uh, this flurry of tumultuous marriages and romances, you have Mozart and Constanze Weber who are sort of uh, an exception 
uh, to the rule. So he's going to um, write a very special piece of music, which we're going to listen to momentarily. It's one of his greatest liturgical triumphs, I think. It's his Mass in C minor. Now, Mozart wrote liturgical music all the time. Most composers set the, the Catholic Mass ordinary to music. The Mass Ordinary consists of five movements. It's called the Ordinary because it would be the text that would be chanted on any regular day, an ordinary day. And it would consist of five rounds of texts. That is to say, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, and finally the Agnus Dei. This particular uh, Mass is unusual for Mozart for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's in a minor key. Mozart overwhelmingly wrote in major keys, as we know, and there are a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons for it is that um, in the Enlightenment period, you wanted your audience to like your music. This was a period in which composers were increasingly concerned with audience reception. They wanted people to buy tickets to go see their music perform because they would often get a take of the, uh, the house. They were also interested in um, selling manuscripts. This was a concern of Beethoven's, right? Uh, and Mozart's to some degree as well. They were also interested in bolstering their own reputation so that they would be very much in demand and command higher rates and salaries and, and would get to greater honorarium fees for their work. So in, this is a really interesting period in music history where people are using their disposable income to go to the concert hall. It's really the first time in history. It starts in the 1750s or 60s and therefore, um, if you're going to try to charm the audience, write in a major key. Minor keys tend to leave us feeling uh, maybe a little bit more despairing, um, sadder perhaps, a sense of um, storm und drang, storm and stress. And major keys, generally speaking, leave us feeling quite happy. As I like to demonstrate to my students at, at Naga Tech Valley Community College, um, you can demonstrate the impact of a minor key by taking a traditional major key melody and playing it in the minor and seeing what it sounds like. And one example I often use is the Mr. Softy theme. If you take the Mr. Softy theme and play it in minor, it sounds downright terrifying. You wouldn't want your children going anywhere near that ice cream man. So Mozart shies away from minor keys. And generally speaking, about 90% of his music is in a major key. The fact that he wrote this very, very uh, ambitious towering mass setting, it's over an hour long in some performances, um, and he never even finished it, by the way. The fact that he wrote this mass in C minor is very telling. He wrote it for a very specific performance. After he married Constanza, he travels back to Salzburg. This would be his last trip to Salzburg. He's going to go see his father and his sister, and he's going to introduce them in person to his wife. Well, there must have been a great deal of tension even before he arrived, and you can guess why. Why do you think Mozart felt anxiety and tension on his way over to Salzburg. What do you think uh, Leopold's attitude was towards Constanza uh, Mozart ne Weber? Well, if you guess that Papa Leopold, who seems to have been something of a contrarian, uh, a great contrarian, uh, if you guess that he was opposed to the nuptials, you would be correct. And so imagine you're Mozart now. You're in your 20s. You're living on your own in Vienna. You're trying to make your way and, and continue to forge your legacy and pay your bills while you're at it. You've met this, uh, this girl who happens to be the sister of someone who broke your heart five years prior. You fall in love, you get married, and then you've got your father writing letters. And remember back then, letters could have taken two weeks to travel from uh, Salzburg to Vienna. So Mozart, after he got married, he gets a letter from his father saying, don't do it. Imagine what that does to a young man. Mozart tries to smooth things over, and it must be said that for all of his, uh, his foibles, uh, Mozart was in incredibly um, devoted as a son and really wanted to be in his father's good graces. And so he, he goes back to Salzburg, and it's a long trip to get to Salzburg, and uh, he wants to present this mass for the first time. And he wants to present it so that he can charm his father and his sister, not only with his own compositions, but namely by showcasing Constanza's voice as a soprano soloist. All of the Weber sisters were talented sopranos. Two of them went on to become professionals who had very successful careers on the operatic stage. Here's Mozart's Mass in C minor 
which starts with this foreboding melody that rises throughout the orchestra, arpeggiating the key of um, C minor uh, when the chorus comes in. But listen to what happens when the orchestra um, sort of backs off and the chorus takes a little uh, breather and the soprano soloist emerges. Notice how the style changes. We could listen to the whole mass right now and I'm sure we'd all be happier for it. But um, of course, it's wonderful that these performances exist and, and are transmitted to us free with no ads. This is the uh, Netherlands Radio Philharmonic Orchestra. And I have to say that this conductor uh, <laughs> has some of the strangest gesticulations I've ever seen from a conductor, but it's a fantastic performance. And the soprano there, is nimble and agile as any professional soprano we would expect them to be. Uh, we can imagine back in 1783 in the summer when Mozart and his wife visited Salzburg for the first and only time, um, what it would have been like for Mozart's family and his friends in Salzburg to hear his wife singing so uh, such a beautifully crafted line that Mozart wrote, tailored to fit her voice like a, a well-fitting uh, garment, I guess Mozart, that's a, a sort of a quote that Mozart wrote about vocal music, uh, that it should fit the singer like a well-tailored garment. Did you notice how low the soprano went in that clip? We just, all the way down to an A flat below, below the staff, essentially below middle C. And then within a bar up to the A flat five, um, two octaves higher. So Constanza Mozart must have had a really impressive range. We know her sisters did. Uh, we especially know his, his uh, sister-in-law, Josefa Hofer, uh, ne Weber, had a fantastic range because Mozart would write the Queen of the Night role for her. But we'll wait until our fourth and final lecture to talk about the Queen of the Night and the Magic Flute. All right. That, uh, if you're wondering, by the way, what was the reaction of Mozart's family well, his father and his sister seems to seem to have uh, had a tepid reaction despite the brilliance of the music presented. It seems that they were stubbornly set in opposition to Mozart's wife. And again, this is going to put them all on the road, if not to estrangement, then to a certain frigid, uh, let's call it a, a cold war of sorts that existed between Mozart and his sister, and certainly between his father. Well, what else uh, was Mozart up to in this period? One thing that he was doing, which is fascinating to me as a, someone who has written a, a dissertation on Bach and spent many, many uh, hours and, and hours and hours combing through Bach's music, performing Bach's music on the keyboard, singing through Bach's music, analyzing Bach's music. Um, Mozart would uh, become acquainted with J.S. Bach's music in this period in Vienna. There's a couple of things leading up to this and they're worth talking about because they're gonna influence many of his later works. Bach had died in 1750, as many of you know, and his music had gone out of fashion really before his own demise in July of that year. You might ask a very good question here, which is, you know, if his music went out of fashion, does that mean nobody was playing it? Does that mean that the scores weren't available, that a composer like Mozart, born six years after Bach's death, would not have really known much about this uh, composer who is so famous now in the 21st century? And the answer is uh, Mozart knew of J.S. Bach, but he was a sort of abstract figure to him. He represented an old and kind of dead style of music. The Enlightenment era musicians did not look favorably upon Baroque music. They felt that it was too, uh, too complex, too busy, as we might say, that it featured uh, too many simultaneous melodies. This is what we call polyphony, polyphonic meaning many sounds presented simultaneously. They favored a simpler uh, texture of music, which we call homophony. Uh, remember that in the Enlightenment, if you look at the philosophy of, for example, the French philosophers who really uh, were making waves in this period, people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Voltaire, Denis Diderot, um, what they were arguing for in life in general, in all matters of life was clarity. And Enlightenment era musicians felt that Baroque music lacked clarity. And for that reason, Bach's music went out of fashion. Mozart has a funny quote, which if you take it on face value, uh, it can be very easily misinterpreted. What he says when he's a, a very young man, he says, Bach is the master, we are the students. 
he meant Johann Christian Bach, Bach's son, who would embrace the sort of galant style of simpler music. He wasn't talking about the father. But when he came to Vienna, Mozart uh, met Emperor Joseph II. We'll talk more about Joseph in uh, next, our next lecture, which is coming up in November. Joseph II was what we would now call, we would probably use the term an enlightened despot, which is to say he was an autocratic ruler, a dictator essentially, but one who was well-read and uh, milder in how he treated his subjects. He invited Mozart to court and asked him to write uh, an opera for the court theater, a sort of a, a new German theater that Emperor Joseph was starting that would specialize in a special kind of opera called Singspiel. Mm -hmm. Mozart would write uh, an opera called uh, Die Entführung aus dem Serail, the abduction from the Seraglio. And eventually uh, that opera would be so successful that it would cause the, uh, the demise of the, the court theater that Joseph had tried the re to create. And the reason it caused the demise is because it was so good that every other contribution to the theater that wasn't Mozart's was uh, thought of as a sort of cheap imitation. And so people stopped going. Um, at any rate, the emperor looked very favorably upon Mozart. And I actually subtitled this lecture, Monstrous Many Notes, because that's a quote that is sometimes attributed to, to uh, Joseph II when he heard one of Mozart's operas. Whether he actually said it not is debated, but he might as well have said it because it fits. What he meant is that Mozart's music was ambitious, and it was ambitious. It was going to get even more ambitious because Mozart was about to discover the music of J.S. Bach. And the reason he discovered it is because when he starts hobnobbing with other figures at court, he meets a guy named Baron Gottfried van Swieten. And this guy, Baron van Swieten, was a great admirer of J.S. Bach's. He collected Bach manuscripts. And so Mozart, there's a story about him going over to van Swieten's library, sitting at the harpsichord and simultaneously reading four different scores. I don't mean one score with four parts. I mean four separate scores arrayed around him, sight reading it at the harpsichord, and pausing and then looking over at Van Spieten and yelling out with a tremendous enthusiasm, now this is something we can all learn from. In other words, Mozart, who had something like contempt for most composers he encountered, uh, came to esteem Bach's music in the absolute highest echelon. And he began to incorporate this Baroque style into his own works. That was very unusual in the 1780s but it wouldn't be unusual for Mozart. We're gonna to listen to Mozart's um, Prelude and Fugue in C, and um, I've got the score pulled up so we can see just how complex this music is. If you really know Bach's music, then you would know that this couldn't be by Bach, but if you were even a, a great listener with a lot of experience, but not a professional musicologist or music theorist, this would be very hard to tell if who wrote this. If I said, if I just played the audio and I said, who do you think composed it? And you said Bach, that would be an excellent, excellent rejoinder. Let's go ahead and listen to this. And then we'll wrap up by talking about Mozart's uh, meeting with Haydn in the um, mid 1780s. Here is the fugue and you can see here that um, Mozart starts the fugue as all fugues start with a solitary uh, presentation of the fugal melody, which is called the subject. Here we go. And I'll pause it there. Again, if you were to listen to this and you thought, oh, sure, that sounds like something that was written by J.S. Bach, that would be a perfectly reasonable guess. In fact, it would be a very educated guess, but it would be wrong. This was written by Mozart shortly after he became acquainted with the Bach manuscripts, thanks to the court librarian at the uh, in the imperial capital at the court of Emperor Joseph II, and his name was Gottfried von Swieten. And this is an important figure because had it not been for Gottfried von Swieten, Mozart would likely never have embraced the Baroque style. And that's important because if he had never embraced the Baroque style, then some of the works we're gonna talk about in the last two lectures of the series might never have been composed. And I, I mean works that probably some of you know very well. The Overture to the Magic Flute is written in a Baroque fugal polyphonic style. The finale of Mozart's final symphony, number 41, called the Jupiter Symphony, is written in a polyphonic style. Uh, Mozart would dabble in this, obviously, in the Requiem. The Requiem involves fugal writing that um, presents itself in the form of a double fugue in the Kyrie of the Mozart Requiem, which we'll also talk about in the uh, subsequent lectures. 
So this style that Mozart absorbed and assimilated so perfectly, really, uh, and I say perfectly because the style in some, some measures is indistinguishable from Bach or Handel, this was really due to his acquaintance with this one individual, Baron Gottfried von Sweden, who had this one quirk of his, he probably had many quirks as we all do, but one of his quirks that would influence music history so profoundly was that he collected Bach manuscripts. So it's really a, an amazing chain of events that leads to some of these works being composed. I'm gonna wrap up our lecture in about 10 minutes. And um, I wanna introduce another figure who will now make his appearance on the stage and that's Franz Josef uh, Haydn. And uh, Josef Haydn was somebody who, um, was born in 1732, the same year as George Washington. He would go on to teach many important composers throughout history, including Beethoven for a time. He would be a prolific composer of symphonic repertoire, especially Haydn wrote 106 symphonies. He wrote almost two dozen operas, none of which are ever performed, by the way. Haydn failed spectacularly in opera where Mozart succeeded so brilliantly. Uh, Haydn wrote in many genres, but his I would say his most famous genres, the ones he was best known for, in fact, the ones he was considered the father of, were symphony, as I mentioned, and also string quartet, which is going to become an increasingly important genre in the classical period. Uh, Goethe, the great poet uh, of Germany, famously described the string quartet as the sort of the musical equivalent of a, um, an intelligent conversation between friends. And Haydn wrote many string quartets, some of which uh, would become very famous. For example, Opus 33, at number two, the Joke Quartet, Opus 76, number two, the second movement, which is the, um, the, the it's called sometimes the, uh, the Kaiser Quartet because it has this theme that would eventually become the German national anthem, Deutschland über alles. That melody started as a Haydn string quartet melody. Haydn was considered the elder statesman of, uh, of European composers by the 1780s. He had written almost 90 symphonies at this point. He had written scads of string quartets and piano pieces and a trumpet concerto and many other works. He wasn't done, by the way. He would con continue composing uh, well into the 1790s and even into the turn of the next century. Mozart, of course, knew who he was. Everybody in Europe who, who, who called his or herself a musician knew who Haydn was. He was the biggest composer in Europe. He had spent most of his career um, employed in a rather posh position as the Kapellmeister to the Prince of the Esterhazy Court in Hungary. And this afforded him an opportunity to compose as he liked for a very, very uh, capable orchestra. He could be ambitious in his writing. Uh, there was even a court theater for whom he could write opera, et cetera. Haydn, though, uh, like so many, would spend uh, time in the winter, especially in, um, in the city. These aristocrats would come to the city, typically in the winter. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would they want to go to a city in the winter? And the answer is because you wouldn't want to be anywhere near a city in the summer, um, especially a city like Vienna. Now, why were cities so disgusting in the summer? In a word, it has to do with horse dung. And uh, the technical term, I guess, would be desiccation, which is a, a way of saying that the horse dung, which would be deposited all over the cobblestone streets of Vienna in the summer air would dry. And it would sort of, uh, this sounds heinous, but it would uh, choke the air with a thick cloying dust, which um, obviously smelled terrible, but would also get people sick and generally speaking, was very unpleasant to be around. And this dust was primarily comprised of horse dung, which had been dried and, and blown around by the breeze. So they, uh, the, they, the aristocrats of Europe who kept residences in the city tended to never to spend time there in the summer. They would only come in the other months. So Haydn winds up meeting Mozart and it's a very auspicious meeting. Um, I, I mentioned that Mozart knew who Haydn was. Haydn absolutely knew who Mozart was. You can imagine what the uh, meeting must have been like between these two. Maybe they were on their guard a bit. Haydn perhaps might have felt a little bit threatened. After all, here's this much younger individual, half his age at the time practically, 
uh, already with so many accolades to his name and obviously um, Haydn's superior in the realm of performance. Haydn was a capable violinist, but he was not a virtuoso the way that Mozart was a virtuoso on the keyboard. And uh, in other circumstances and with different temperaments and different people, perhaps, these two might have um, held each other in some degree of suspicion. Haydn may have tried to protect his spot by, um, by not interacting much with Mozart and not giving him a chance to demonstrate his clear superiority as a performer. And yet that was the opposite of what happened. Uh, when they met, they became fast friends, great friends. And um, when Mozart's father came to visit and met Haydn some years later, um, Leopold Mozart was hanging out with Haydn and Haydn said, I wanna tell you before God and before Everyone here is an honest man. I tell you that your son is the greatest living composer known to me. And for Leopold Mozart, this must have been incredibly gratifying to hear. Haydn, because of his influence and his, his legacy as a composer of string quartets, must have uh, spurred Mozart to write string quartets of his own. And Mozart had written string quartets before. But the one he's going to write for Haydn, he's going to write a collection of six. The one we're going to look at uh, the one that is in C, it's called the Dissonance Quartet, is wholly unlike anything that had ever been written, uh, either in the string quartet genre or in any genre up to this point. When you listen to it, it may sound like it was written by Alban Berg or Arnold Schoenberg or Igor Stravinsky. Uh, it is so dissonant, it is so um, tonally unstable, tonally ambiguous, that you might even use the word atonal to describe at least the first opening bars. Let's take a look at the... Um, the score. Well, this is a uh, viola clef, so we've got to transpose that. That's actually an A flat. So we start with the note A flat over the C. The C is pedaled here for the first two bars. And we get an E flat over that. So that's kind of like a first inversion major chord, but then we get an A natural here, which is, the, you want to talk about upsetting and overturning the apple cart. Uh, this note that comes in in the first violin is going to do exactly that, and it's going to render the music almost uh, incoherent to the listener, certainly to an 18th century listener. Let's listen to the Dissonance Quartet, uh, which Mozart wrote uh, for Haydn and dedicated to him. This is not the kind of music you would expect from an 18th century composer, certainly not one of the Enlightenment period. Remember, we said in the Enlightenment, the philosophers and the musicians of that day believed that music should have clarity, it should uh, have a sort of noble spirit, and therefore um, the melody should be supported by some kind of stable harmony. The melody should have an elegant contour, something singable, cantabile perhaps, and this is not that. If we look at the opening page, again, C, A flat in the viola, E flat, A natural, uh, F sharp, C sharp, another F sharp, B flat. The notes keep changing. And all of these symbols, for those who don't re read music, these are inflections that are changing uh, sort of the pitch of these individual notes. So rather than a B natural, this is a B flat, which then becomes B natural. We call this music chromatic music. It comes from the Greek word chromos, which of course means colorful. And uh, the idea here is that by introducing all of these foreign tones, the music is introducing new colors. But what it amounts to, especially for a listener in the late 18th century, is music that must have been absolutely incoherent. There's a famous story about Haydn um, attending a performance of this. And what, um, what happened was he was standing next to someone who elbowed him essentially in the ribs and said, what's this Mozart guy crazy? Well, he doesn't know what he's doing. And Haydn sternly said something like, I assure you, Mozart knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, so even though this string quartet is so unusual, uh, and so bitingly dissonant in its introduction, it actually breaks into uh, something far more uh, appropriate for the Enlightenment period. Let's go ahead and look at that. Just a little bit of that. I wanna leave time for questions and, and wrap up the um, lecture component here. We talked about how Mozart in coming to Vienna broke away from several key figures in his life. He broke away from the archbishop who was his employer. More importantly, he broke away from his father who had been 
not only a father, but also his teacher, his travel companion, his friend in some way, his uh, the steward of his fortunes, you might say, someone who um, set him up for a life in music by teaching him everything he had to give. And, and it must be said, for all of the flaws that Leopold Mozart had, and he had many, um, that he devoted his entire industry to educating his son and giving his son every opportunity to succeed as a musician is incontrovertible. For that alone, he deserves our praise. But um, in moving to Vienna, Mozart is going to break away from his father. And by breaking away from his father, he's actually gonna break away from his sister as well. So he's very much gonna be on his own, except he's not on his own because as we learned today, uh, in moving to Vienna, Mozart is going to rent a room of all places with the Weber family, with whom he had crossed paths five years prior in Mannheim. Now he's going to be renting a room there and he's going to fall in love with one of the Weber girls, the sister of the Weber sister who had um, spurned him and broken his heart in 1777. This sister uh, would fall in love with him. And this was Constanze Weber who would go on to be his wife, a wife with whom he had many years of happy marriage before his premature demise in 1791. They had two children together, and we'll talk a little bit about their children in the later program. Uh, Karl Thomas Mozart was born in 1780, uh, excuse me, 1784, and uh, Franz Xaver Mozart was born in 1791 in July, just about five months before his father died. Um, and both of them would grow into adulthood. The, actually, Mozart and Constanze had six children, but only two survived to adulthood. We said that Mozart established himself as a freelance musician he wrote music on commission, and that included for some very high profile clients, all the way up to the emperor of Austria himself, Joseph II. We also said that Mozart taught and occasionally wrote music for his pupils, but that he did not really relish teaching. It was not uh, in his hard wiring to enjoy the act of teaching. We also said that Mozart, uh, despite being somewhat estranged from his sister and having a frigid relationship with his father, He's going to find something of a surrogate replacement for his father in the form of Joseph Haydn, who's 24 years his elder, and with whom he would cross paths on several occasions when Haydn would come to visit Vienna. Eventually, the two would become, I think it's fair to say, exceptionally close. And uh, their last goodbye would be a tearful one. I'll tell you about that in the coming programs. Speaking of the coming programs, we're going to address the next uh, chapters in Mozart life, Mozart's life, namely, the unfolding of his career as a freelance musician, his success, his startling success in the realm of opera. We'll also talk about his uh, participation, his joining what was then one of the secret societies of Europe, namely the Freemasons. And we'll talk about how Mozart, who uh, grew up as a baptized Catholic, how he squared his beliefs in his own faith with being a member of a group that was uh, in many ways at odds with the Catholic Church. In fact, Freemasons who practiced openly uh, were often uh, threatened with excommunication from the Catholic Church. Uh, we'll talk about what Mozart's beliefs were. And of course, we wanna know if his association with the uh, Masonic Lodge, the Voltetigkeit Beneficence Lodge, if that, um, influence his compositions in any way. And of course, that question's as loaded as a baked potato because the answer, as you might have guessed, is yes. All this and much more in November's lecture where I hope you'll join me. In the meantime, uh, I welcome any questions you might have. Um, let's see, someone asked, I'm looking through the Q&A. Uh, did the tw twins uh, achieve, came in the music world? Well, I, I think fame. Achieve fame, yes, that, that makes sense, yeah. Uh, yes, um, the uh, Sunatishvili twins are, are, I would say, you know, they're not first-tier pianists. That would be, you know, the Yuja Wans, Anna Fedorova, Daniel Trifonov. Those would be the sort of most highly regarded pianists, but they're up in, in a, a very high tier, I would say, yes. Uh, heinous, the, so uh, David is describing what I uh, was talking about with respect to Vienna in the summer. Um, night soil pails being dumped into the sea, into the uh, streets, yes, and the, uh, the, the rank smell. Yeah, being uh, alive back then, you know, we watch these television programs um, like the Tudors or Game of Thrones where they tend to romanticize life in, um, in bygone eras, whether it's the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or even the 18th century. And uh, life back then, 
you know, was not, um, it was not as glamorous as it's made out to be, not only in film and television, but also in novels. Um, I'm reading a book right now by Alison Weir uh, about Eleanor of Aquitaine, and it, the book uh, makes it seem like life in the 1160s was very sexy, but in fact, I can imagine it was probably uh, quite gross by modern standards. Yeah, and in fact, um, for those who are wondering, I uh, will always upload uh, to my Facebook page uh, information regarding upcoming lectures. So you can go ahead and, and look for me on Facebook, uh, Dr. Gil Harrell Lectures, and you can uh, follow me around virtually as I talk about various sundry topics. Gil, great, great talk, fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending this evening's programming event. And I hope you all enjoyed Gil's presentation of Mozart in Venice, uh, sorry, Vienna. Thank you very much and have a good night. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.